Okay, I'll start talking. Um, this is a repeat of um, what I did last Saturday, except um, probably a little smoother since I'm rehearsed now. <clears throat> um, I had fun making this talk, and my daughter sort of laughed at um, the concept. I tend to get global and um, wider and wider perspectives and things I look at. And so she was making jokes about if I went back to the Big Bang and how medicine came from that. But uh, at any rate, um, I have a few points I'll make in this uh, talk that are recurring themes. One is that absolutely millions of people have gone into making um, antibiotics and modern medicine what it is. And most of them are uh, nameless, but uh, they contributed along the way. And many good ideas arise in many different places at the same time or nearly the same time or sometimes a century or two before. And then aren't taken seriously, so for whatever reason. But I think it's all driven uh, by basic needs. And I took this uh, Maslow's uh, pyramid uh, and uh, made my own isosceles trapezoid flipped. So I think um, probably, especially in the northern climates or the extreme climates, um, in altitude or uh, toward the poles, um, warmth uh, is a, an immediate need. And if you don't have it within a matter of hours, you can die. And um, water is next. And uh, people throughout human history have tended to follow the rivers and the streams. And then food. And in between taking care of these needs, rest. Uh, one thing that uh, I've read before about hunter-gatherers is uh, looking at primitive, uh, or what one would term primitive societies, is that um, they spend about two or three hours a day taking care of their needs. The rest of the time they spend uh, uh, chatting and socializing or uh, gazing off at the mountains or whatever they want to do. Um, and was probably a happier existence for humankind and as nomadic hunter-gatherers uh, dealing with problems as they arose. And uh, there's a lot less uh, hierarchy in society, I think. But uh, uh, at any rate, I think so much of science and especially biology came out of agriculture. And I think the first step in developing agriculture for humankind was probably not tilling soil. They may have ended up someplace like um, what became Mesopotamia and the Fertile tr uh, uh, Crescent and such, uh, Tigris and the uh, Frades rivers uh, where life was good and uh, uh, been able to subsist by gathering things at first until their population grew. But I think the first step was to, to become herdsmen and uh, maybe dog owners, canine owners, to have uh, this incredible magical power of uh, becoming bonded to an animal and uh, having grown up on a primitive farm myself, um, I understand how you, if you have much experience with animals, you can see their spirit by looking at them and watching what they do. And um, I think that the uh, allusion to cattle, especially in mythology, and some religions is related to the importance of uh, 
uh, being herdsmen and a transition from being nomadic hunter-gatherers to becoming farmers. So I put these pictures in here and uh, it went from the nurturing uh, paternalistic view of this universe as in um, Hindu religions and uh, Norse religion where, uh, or Norse mythology where um, the uh, cow uh, had rivers of milk uh, uh, from its teats and it licked the rind from the rocks and uh, exposed uh, the uh, frost giants and the gods to uh, a creation story. Um, and it evolved to uh, uh, paternalistic myths uh, such as the Minotaur in Crete. Uh, and that was a Picasso sketch there at the bottom of the Minotaur uh, showing violence and brutality uh, and uh, subjugation of women and that sort of thing. So um, uh, I think uh, archetypes and uh, explanation of man's collective consciousness that way is a really fascinating thing. If you're interested in that, you might want to read uh, Joseph Campbell as a start. Uh, if you haven't heard of him, most of you probably have. Uh, eventually, we got into agriculture and using animals that had so much more power. And they uh, interesting. They show this. Uh, 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 this is from a, 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 a grave or burial chamber of Sinudum. Sinudum. That's it's it's. It's listed there in German, but it's a painting on a, on a grave chamber. Um, and um, the cattle are so, shown so much smaller than the man, uh, maybe trying to suggest dominance of man over the animals. But uh, if you try to compare the strength of the strongest man in the world to that of an average horse, it's... Uh, Pathetically one-sided. Uh, uh, okay, let me keep going here. As soon, well, one other point about the these uh, cattle were awesome, and this aura uh, that existed until uh, I think 1627 or so um, was uh, about uh, a kilo, uh, kilo uh, well, a, a thousand kilograms and um, seven feet at the shoulder, 2.13 meters at the shoulder. And um, Caesar talked of them and said how um, uh, they were like diminutive elephants and they could hold their own against man or beast. And they're depicted in cave uh, paintings, as you see at the top there. Uh, one... Uh, uh, and, and I, I point that out just to go back to primitive man looking at the natural world before it had been tortured and attenuated. Managed to do um, it was a lot more level playing field, uh, and the uh, animals they saw must have struck all in their minds. Um, there were a couple of brothers in the 1930s who were um, uh, Hitler supporters um, who um, they wanted to make Germany great again, I guess. Uh, uh, there must be some kind of acronym that they could put on a red cap for that. But at any rate, uh, they tried to rebreed the Aurach and... Um, the uh, Nazi or uh, Nazi propaganda relied a lot on uh, what they considered Aryan mythology or any sort of Norse mythology, including the uh, Ring Cycle by Wagner, Richard Wagner, uh, his four operas about uh, um, uh, Norse mythology. And uh, if I've uh, insulted anyone here, I'm sorry, but uh, I uh, 
I have no sympathy for Nazis and fascism. That's it. That's the way it is. Uh, at any rate, it's, it was an interesting thing to me that they're actually working on rebreeding something akin to the super cows. And by around uh, 2020 or 2025, they think they'll have them. And they think they have an important uh, um, place in the ecology of Europe. Uh, grazing animals that could fend for themselves. So now as soon as you had farming, you had uh, hard labor. If you've ever worked on a farm and done any uh, working of the soil and uh, just from gardening, if you've done gardening, you know it can be very hard work. And um, uh, it as soon as uh, people started to argue, I would work by my wits and you work by your hands, uh, you could start to have uh, stratification of society and uh, subjugation of people. And slavery emerged pretty quickly, uh, and as well as the excuses for why some people should be slaves. And uh, for instance, this uh, unfortunate gentleman in the right who has keloid scars on his back from being whipped. Uh, and uh, there's still slavery in the world today. Moving on now, uh, it's been noted humans, uh, the main take home point on this slide is that humans spend uh, uh, more time working uh, than eating. They, uh, uh, when compared to chimpanzees or orangutans or other primates, uh, humans don't like to uh, uh, consider themselves primates, but I can't see much difference. Uh, at any rate, um, uh, humans with uh, the smaller jaws and smaller teeth and uh, larger brain uh, manage to eat uh, pretty quickly and get the calories they need to sustain themselves. And uh, the other primates spend nine to 12 hours a day eating. Part of that's because of the food they eat, but a large part of it's because of cooking. And this goes, I, I gave some uh, citations here from Oliver Goldsmith, among uh, other uh, 18th century uh, writers onto um, uh, modern uh, primatologists have been interested in the fact that uh, cooking probably allowed a lot of growth in the human population and uh, specialization away from having massive jaws and claws. Um, cook, you can uh, increase the nutritive uh, value of whatever you're eating. If you've got a dead bone, you can boil it and there's collagen in it. and minerals leach out and you could a broth, bone broth. It's got considered a prominent part of prehistoric diets. I've also read arguments that uh, humans were scavengers and um, or they were farmers and uh, go to kills and break open the bones using the hands and suck the marrow out. And the marrow has a lot of fat content. Um, So over the past almost 2 million years, uh, there's been a fair amount of divergence uh, from uh, hominids uh, and other primates. Um, this is a facetious uh, list here of the diet of a chimpanzee. They don't really have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It all runs together. Uh, that's because they don't have to get back to work unless it's to reproduce or maybe protect a territory or something. The um, uh, use of fire uh, has been uh, probably uh, in play for at least a million years. And um, 
this this slide is a fabricated uh, painting of Neanderthals and uh, what looks like a valley full of uh, game, but uh, including mastodons. But uh, uh, 400,000 years ago were the first fireplaces. I threw this one in for fun. Uh, as I mentioned, a bone broth. And they actually sell bone broth, chickens or other animals. And I found this uh, little poster that I thought uh, uh, was uh, I sort of personally related to it. Chickens uh, can be quite affectionate if they're treated nicely. Almost any animal, if they're treated nicely, and they don't have to eat you, then see you as prey, not starving to death, or be uh, uh, sweet, bonded. I'll turn on you sometimes if it's uh, not a good situation. Try to be careful, know what you're doing. At any rate, um, one other thing that emerged was pottery. And I suspect that fires on a clay base may have given the idea. But since 14,000 years, earthenware uh, was made. That's quite porous. It doesn't store liquids very long. Um, and uh, I read about uh, in Japan, for instance, uh, uh, there was evidence of, uh, uh, I swept my track far here, I got out, cut off, excuse me. Uh, uh, they would make baskets and coat them with clay. And um, uh, make earthenware. And they talk about preserving fish. They would ferment fish. I thought that was really quite interesting. There was a lot of uh, fermentation as a as, uh, way of storing food. That was one of the major problems. Uh, the idea of storing fish that was fermented, I think, is really interesting. And there's variations on how you do that. You Fish almost immediately starts to decompose. And there's a couple of diseases I want to mention to you. Uh, 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 ciguatera is a ciguatera toxin comes from a dinoflagellate uh, type of uh, algae bloom that's eaten by smaller fish and then predatory fish like barracudas and Spanish mackerel and uh, a grouper and uh, sea bass that eat the smaller fish concentrate this in their tissues. And uh, it, uh, this toxin from this algae in uh, Ciguatera affects uh, sodium channels. And uh, it, it really uh, is associated with fish caught in Caribbean, Central America, Hawaii, and uh, near the equator, plus or minus 35 degrees latitude or so. That's what I recall. And um, uh, it's a lipid toxin that is heat stable. Cooking doesn't destroy it. You can't taste it. Uh, and uh, it can make you sick sometimes for years, usually for weeks or months. Um, it's not so common to get die from it. Uh, pretty quickly, you can get nausea and uh, cramps and abdominal pain and vomiting and diarrhea. And then. Uh, heart effects, cardiac effects, and uh, um, muscle effects. And uh, so uh, one thing that's generally in eating really large fish. Uh, uh, there's another disease that I, I, I didn't talk about this last Saturday, but it, it's, I think it's quite interesting. It's uh, scromboid. Um, when you have fish that's uh, dead, bacteria can act on the flesh of the fish muscle and start to break down uh, the muscle and make bioactive amines, particularly histamine. Histamine in massive levels can cause uh, bad effects. Histamine is one of the major um, mediators of uh, allergy. Um, like allergic rhinitis, uh, allergy to pollen. Um, that's part of antihistamines. 
Well, these histamine levels can be extremely high, and uh, histamine can cause uh, um, capil increased capillary permeability and, uh, and uh, loss of uh, basically third space uh, displacement of uh, your extracellular fluids uh, or vascular fluids and cause shock. Uh, this also, uh, you, you may have a, like a metallic taste, but often it's said that there's no particular taste or um, uh, visual effect that you can de uh, detect to tell if the fish has not been managed uh, right and has partially de decomposed this way. Um, any fish that's caught should be kept at um, below 40 degrees uh, Fahrenheit continuously. Uh, and that's 4.4444 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, uh, at infinitum degrees centigrade. So less than five degrees centigrade uh, or else then uh, they can become dangerous. Now, most of the stuff I've read, they say this is uh, rarely fatal, but I actually knew a physician who had um, eel in uh, a fish of some sort in uh, uh, the Outer Banks in North Carolina, and uh, driving home, he got sick, and he recognized that he had scromboid, and he died from shock. He, his blood pressure dropped out from so much histamine that he could tell where, where it was going. It usually starts with uh, nausea, vomiting, cramps, diarrhea, tearing, uh, and, uh, uh, and some overlap in symptoms with sequitera. Uh, so uh, at any rate, storing of food, I thought, think is a real interesting problem. And uh, he's, uh, this is just a, uh, I wanted to show uh, examples from early earthenware. And glazing didn't start until some time later. And uh, lead glazing really started in the uh, Roman Empire. Not one of their best ideas. But it, uh, it sealed uh, the uh, earthenware. One of the uh, outcomes of fire, I, I think of fire as a bigger thing that uh, humans uh, achieve by discovering how to uh, have energy from the environment uh, and release it in a controlled way, how to use heat to drive processes. Uh, and the kiln was a big step in that uh, with kilns, uh, back to Mesopotamia as the first updraft kiln, which is something like a, like a chimney. Um, uh, they could cook, but uh, they also could um, uh, fire pottery better. And uh, if you look at uh, temperatures attainable with burning charcoal, if you take wood and you uh, heat it, uh, with limited oxygen, the, um, uh, you'll drive off uh, uh, the uh, water component uh, from the um, carbohydrates and end up with more pure carbon. Uh, pure carbon, you can get a pretty high temperature. And uh, get higher than that, you have to pump air in there. It's oxygen levels and things like that. I, just for interest, I put in melting points of metals. Uh, I think that, uh, and, and compare that to the uh, melting point of uh, a clay component, uh, kaolin, at the bottom of that list there. Um, the um, uh, um, kaolin is, there's about uh, three, uh, salicylate type uh, components to clay uh, and kaolin is uh, one that's common and it's actually used and small divided particles can be ingested for uh, uh, diarrhea it's absorptive um, 
And I put this slide in just because I thought it was uh, fascinating. And the um, uh, uh, link to it online is to the right uh, so that I could get two col uh, I made two columns of, it's a long, long timeline that goes vertically, but I just got the first part of it. Um, gold is something you could discover easily if you were wandering about, um, especially in streams where the uh, wash uh, off of mountains and um, um, gold tended to form in nuggets often and uh, those get swept downstream heavy so they spotted water uh, in a shallow stream especially like panning for gold gold uh, and um, humans like crows like shiny objects uh, uh, copper uh, native copper can occur um, but most of the time it's uh, in an ore uh, but it could be smelted and then silver silver is quite interesting and uh, then you can get into more toxic things but uh, silver has medicinal qual qualities uh, they used to put uh, I guess going back to the 1880s silver nitrate uh, prophylaxis for gonorrhea of the conjunctiva put uh, drops of uh, silver nitrate in the eyes of newborns uh, because they could get uh, this inflammation of their conjunctiva, which is this uh, external sort of mucosa lining of the uh, eye up to the cornea and under the lid. And uh, in some cases that would cause perforation of the cornea and infection in the globe, um, the globe being the eyeball. Um, and so putting silver nitrate uh, is it's quite toxic for the bacteria. And uh, there's really no bacterial resistance to silver. Uh, uh, nowadays, they uh, tend to use erythromycin eye ointment. Uh, and uh, that is usually effective. And chlamydia is a big uh, concern for infection of the eye. Gonorrhea these days, but uh, either can do. Um, cause a lot of problems. Kind of tragic for a newborn to end up blind because of an eye infection picked up on their way through the birth canal. Um, also, uh, silver uh, in the uh, form of silver uh, sulfidine. Uh, it's an ointment that uh, uh, I had experience too with the using these in severe burns. Uh, I told the story, I won't go through all that again right now, but of uh, years ago when I was in training, I had uh, two patients with similar severe, uh, similar severity of third degree burns, which is full loss of uh, skin thickness. So they have terrible fluid losses first that you have to replace or they'll die. And they'll die of shock. Uh, and quite quickly too. And uh, then um, uh, um, they are vulnerable to infection. And uh, so you put these dressings on and with silver sulfidine and uh, or silver ointment and uh, take them to hover tanks and, uh, and sterile water and they uh, lower them into it and scream in pain as it's a horrible experience. And uh, the dressings soak off and then apply fresh dressings and try to skin grafts on as fast as you can. But uh, it's uh, interesting that uh, the second uh, common metal to be, um, I guess third common metal used by humans uh, has medicinal qualities this way. Uh, there's also stories of um, Alexander the Great and his incursions into India. Uh, his uh, army had dysentery at the 
commanders tended to have less severe problems. And it was, uh, according to the story, it was attributed to the silver cups. They drank. So. Glass also uh, was an extremely important advance and uh, probably arose from um, hot fire on sand. Uh, but it goes back um, about uh, 3,500 uh, uh, before the Common Era. That's, that's about 5,500 years ago. Um, and the first glass vessels are, are from um, about um, uh, uh, 3,500 years ago. And uh, about uh, uh, 21 or 22 centuries ago, Syrian craftsmen invented the blowpipe. And that'll come into a story I'm going to tell a little bit uh, later. But I have constituents of uh, soda lime glass here. Uh, I wanted to mention, I'm jumping forward now, I wanted to mention the inventiveness and how ideas emerged that were ahead of their time uh, or that gave way for really clever adaptations as uh, greater insight emerged. Uh, this uh, Dennis Papin uh, was a Huguenot, so he had to flee from France, lived in Germany for a time, and then I died in London, uh, but he invented a steam digester in 1679. Uh, he, uh, I'd, I'd given a talk on statistics earlier on, and de Mauvray was uh, similar. He was a Huguenot who had to France because of the religious persecution, uh, uh, which uh, was a benefit to the countries like Holland and uh, Germany and uh, Britain that uh, uh, these folks fled to because they were often uh, educated and craftsmen and engineers. But uh, he also invented a steam engine in 1690, uh, uh, and he built it in 1707 and uh, in Hanover and uh, in Germany and uh, was going up the river with it. He had permission to do this, and uh, it was attacked by, uh, uh, this made me think of the story of the Luddites, uh, a mob of local river boatmen who figured this is going to be the end of our jobs if we let him get away with it. So they destroyed his boat. But this fellow in the 1600s invented a piston that worked, a mechanical piston, which considering materials and the techniques for working metals, even at that point, uh, was, which is pretty much craftsmanship. It's quite an achievement. At any rate, uh, I go jump about here a bit. Um, food preservation techniques, uh, it would not be a bad idea to um, uh, have some of these in your repertoire. Uh, I mentioned last week, I consider the universe uh, an unstable, dangerous place. People particularly are dangerous. And uh, you can have periods of time go by when uh, everything you take for granted, uh, medicines to electricity to water to food supplies to security are totally lost. And you might be... Uh, able to survive if you know some fundamental tricks from history. Uh, uh, drying a food, it's, it's interesting if you, drying meat is more dangerous. You have to really be careful about meat and fish uh, fermenting. It, it, it generally requires salting or acidification uh, and immerse it in alcohol, things like this. But otherwise, the decay will be so rapid. Uh, one difference between uh, uh, animal sources of food that you're going to preserve and uh, vegetable matter is the vegetables basically you peel them alive. You you uh, don't kill them and have them rot. They're they're 
just because they're picked from the tree doesn't mean they're dead. Um, so uh, uh, it's, I think that's one thing that defines uh, the uh, difference. And uh, it's much easier to safely store vegetables and fruits than it is um, meats and fish uh, and uh, animal products. Culturing also is one way you can it's longer. It's, it's making yogurt. Made a batch of yogurt yesterday that'll last me a week. It's a mag microbiology experiment in a process. Uh, uh, Lactobacillus bacteria use uh, your previous yogurt as an inoculum for your uh, flash heated milk. Um, and fermenting wine, I put this in simply as a um, kind of a road map that can be applied to fermenting most anything. Um, but wine has a lot of culture to it. Uh, and uh, it, uh, basically four, four easy steps. You uh, stomp the grapes and uh, uh, make must, which is this mixture and then a primary fermentation based on yeast that's on the skin. And that's really active in that first five days. And then you rack it, uh, racking uh, as you pour off uh, the supernatant and, uh, or you siphon it off. And uh, if you taste wine and you hold wine up to the light and look good, you wanna look before you spin it um, to see that uh, there's not a lot of sediment shouldn't be a lot of sediment in it. Um, and uh, after the first five days, um, you can rack several times where you, because you'll get more sediment uh, as yeast get killed off because they've used up their oxygen and their sugars and uh, the alcohol level increases. They last, uh, the first 70% of the alcohol comes about in the first five days. So uh, it'd be pretty easy for uh, primitive people if they've got a container to put fruit in that uh, doesn't let a lot of oxygen in to get some kind of liquid that would have some alcohol in it. Um, the secondary fermentation, uh, it's continuation of the same process. That's not the same as second fermentation. Secondary fermentation means a second step where it just slows down and tell by the look of it that it's foam from the yeast activity and you start to get just little tiny bubbles and uh, not, not this uh, kind of raging fire of metabolic activity going as the yeast are growing and using up their uh, 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 substrate. So uh, if you do a second fermentation, I, I realize that I have a little note here. It, uh, uh, you can put some extra f uh, fruit material uh, to feed the yeast, and they'll make more carbon dioxide. And if it's sealed, you can make a sparkling wine. So you can stop the fermentation process with cold shock, or you can add sulfur trioxide. Uh, generally, uh, qualitates wine or quality wine uh, not have sulfides in it. And uh, pasteurization uh, is really important. And I'm going to talk about that in my second part a little bit more. But uh, if you heat wine above 104 degrees Fahrenheit or 40 degrees centigrade, that'll kill the yeast. Uh, you can still have other pathogens in the wine. Um, and uh, if you want to kill those, that the ones that are most likely to make you sick, uh, you heat it to. Uh, I I mostly known of um, seventy degrees centigrade for fifteen minutes or so uh, is is pretty typical for pasteurization. I, I don't have experience with flash pasteurizations. Um, I um, the way I I've, I do something in between these two when I make yogurt. Uh, I actually grew up drinking raw milk from a herd, a herd of cattle. Uh, wasn't pasteurized. 
Uh, one of the later talks I want to do along these lines is about mycobacterium and tuberculosis. And you can have bovine tuberculosis and you can have uh, atypical mycobacteria that cause diseases like scrofula where you can have draining lymph nodes, especially in the neck and uh, uh, or in the face uh, from ingesting these other mycobacterium. Uh, those are also killed by pasteurization. But uh, uh, you have to watch, if you don't pasteurize, you have to really watch your herd and uh, be able to recognize if, you're, if you've got uh, uh, sick cattle. And um, these mycobacterium just in the soil, they're ubiquitous, really. Um, you can also stop the uh, fermentation by dumping some alcohol in vodka. Uh, and uh, uh, I like this, uh, this uh, Demijohn uh, uh, term for these. Uh, it's part of the wine culture. It's these enormous 60-liter uh, bottles that have a narrow top worked. And even the technology of being able to seal these, these are impermeable, uh, non-porous uh, containers uh, that'll keep oxygen and ke uh, keep gases out on the atomic level. But uh, uh, even sealing, techniques of sealing these things has come a, a ways. German, it's a Korbflasche. It's uh, uh, Often these are, the, the ones I have in this picture don't show it, but they uh, have a basket uh, that they're uh, enveloped in that helps the handling and helps them not to get broken. Uh, now, getting up to an interesting point, there was, um, and this relates more than you might think to uh, medicine I want to talk about uh, uh, as, a, as we go along. Uh, Napoleon wanted to have ways of conserving food for his army. And he offered 12,000 francs. And um, Nicholas Appert was a confectioner who figured out a way of doing this. And uh, he uh, uh, did a lot of experiments over at least six years. And he didn't get, he, he got stiff for a long time, but after about 10 years, they started to pay him off. The French government I think, started to pay him off for his contribution. Uh, but he came up with a way of preserving food by heating it and keeping it separate from air. And he would basically put it in the bottle, put a seal on it uh, with wax or corking, but these were, um, Narrow, a narrow mouth bottle, but uh, um, and he did experiments in heating the water bath for varying lengths of time, and that was successful, um, variably successful, but uh, uh, pretty stupendous for the day and age. Uh, he, he did a big uh, demo. He um, bottled and he preserved a, a whole sheep and. Uh, show he could do it, I guess. So I'm, I'm not going to get into this too much, but it's, it's sort of related to uh, the pasteurization, except you, these, are, these are sealed. Uh, in, in the 21st century, you got two ways of canning. And you use a hot bath, hot water bath, where uh, uh, I have the range in temperatures in both Fahrenheit and centigrade there for 35 minutes to two hours. I tend to, I would not tend to cut that short um, if you're going to use hot water bath. Uh, pressure canning, where you can have a sealed container, has a rack and put some water in it. It's uh, sort of like the steam digester that uh, I've invented that I showed you a minute ago, um, which has a lot of industrial uses. Uh, I'll tell you about it further later. Um, if you're going to can things like tomatoes, or, or generally, if you can more acidic, acidic things, then you'll be OK. Uh, if you're not um, careful, you can uh, inadequately process these things. And uh, 
end up with botulinum, which is a clostridium. Botulinum is a, it's a soil bacteria. It's really durable. It can situations. Uh, um, there's a number of things like anthrax, clostridium, uh, tetanus, uh, clostridium botulinum. They can form spores. So, and when it when times are good, they desporulate and uh, go back into cellular form and invade, and they produce exotoxins. Uh, there are uh, seven exotoxins associated with botulinum. They're called A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and A and D particularly are noted for uh, causing human disease. They're in, in medicine, and uh, tell you very quickly, it's uh, Maybe the most toxic natural uh, um, natural occurring substance with the highest toxicity in on the planet in terms of its effect on humans. Um, so you want to use um, clean jars. They can be uh, sterilized in a dishwasher, or you can boil them, which isn't a bad idea. And use tongs um, and there are specialized jars that you can get nowadays that uh, are, there's some history behind that. And you can um, uh, blanch the um, tomatoes, right, kind of flash boil them, and then the skin peels off uh, much the way it happens with humans if they get uh, bad scalding, their skin just disappears. Uh, it's really severe, it just peels off and it's gone. Um, uh, then the boiling water, you, if it's a, a hot water canning, you want um, to put it in boiling water. It's on a rack, so it's not right on the bottom of the container. And jars are have water over there, over the top of them. And uh, uh, most people don't monitor the water bath if they're doing home canning. Uh, like that, if it's boiling, it's boiling, uh, and uh, so you would be in excess of the temperatures they list there, uh, which generally is not a problem. Um, putting pickling salts now, pickling salts uh, are not like table salt. Table salt has uh, iodide and uh, anti-caking ingredients, which can even be things like kaolin. Those little particles I mentioned that are in, uh, part of clay that can make earthenware that are absorptive. They help keep salt granulated, but you want to use pure salt. And uh, the salting helps reduce uh, extra salinity. And I give a, a level here, about 10% uh, um, uh, like 10 gram percent uh, salt solution would be uh, a mixture like I uh, list there, uh, two to three mil, uh, milliliters of uh, the salt powder to uh, Eater of uh, water. And then lemon juice is great for acidifying. And uh, lemon juice often has a pH of about 4.2. And uh, if you put uh, 30 milliliters in um, a liter of water, it's a pH of about 4.5. If you have a pH of 4.5 in a food, then generally bacteria are not going to grow in it. One of the major reasons why bacteria stops stops growing in a culture medium is because of the acidity from the waste products that they produce by their metabolism. Okay, I'm gonna move ahead. Uh, the microscope was a major uh, step forward, which then was kind of was there and then kind of not exploited, but Leeuwenhoek uh, in 1666 was credited with making the first real successful one. Uh, his uh, is a single lens. Uh, this, this flat plate in this picture is actually a two brass or 10 plates uh, riveted together and there's a little convex lens in it, a single lens. and the tip of this point, uh, just outside of that aperture, upper third, is the, where the specimen was put. It could be a drop of um, pond water or blood or uh, scrapings from his teeth. He looked, you, spermatozoa, he looked at 
is a spectacular actress. Um, and must have had very good eyes and probably stood shade with the specimen just getting sunlight uh, and uh, look through the hole. And um, he could see things with magnification up to 250, which is stunning for a single, simple microscope like this. Um, the uh, shape of the lens in these cases were uh, uh, convex or biconvex. It was lentil shaped, like the lentil seeds. And lentil is the origin of, the, the Latin word for lentil is the origin for uh, the word lens. It's named for the shape and uh, for food. Um, now, uh, he got his, he was a lens maker, uh, glasses for reading and uh, seeing better, uh, especially for reading, I think, uh, or looking at things close, uh, uh, had become more and more popular, and this is in uh, the Netherlands. And uh, uh, his best uh, glass um, that he was able to uh, uh, develop into a lens came from the droplet of the little bead of glass that was on um, glass blower's pipe. And uh, uh, which I think is kind of interesting, it goes back to the invention of the glass blower's pipe uh, by uh, the first century uh, before the common era Syrian uh, craftsman. So at any rate, it's, I, I actually find this really fascinating that this was such simple uh, uh, design, he was able to achieve what he did. Now, a uh, hundred years before, well, 70 years before, 1590, uh, there was a father and son who were lens makers who made a compound microscope. And this has two uh, pipes that are um, uh, nested and sort of like a telescope. And um, uh, it was a compound microscope with uh, a, uh, the objective or the part that was down by the uh, object to be looked at was uh, uh, convex on one side and flat on the other. And the other lens was uh, uh, biconvex. And it only had um, a, a magnification of 10x, 10 power, which isn't much. It's uh, you could do almost that well uh, with a uh, good handheld uh, magnifying glass. Um, the uh, Robert Hooke uh, further developed that microscope and made refinements. Uh, I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. And uh, uh, he published in 1665, uh, uh, Micrographia, uh, and uh, one of the uh, drawings depicted mucor. Mucor is a fungus. Uh, I've had some patients that had mucor uh, that uh, particu particularly with uh, diabetics uh, and their impaired immunity, they get uh, or growing in their sinus and it can be invasive and invade the globe, invade the uh, eye socket, uh, go through bone. It requires uh, generally, and it kills, kills tissue as it goes, and it requires uh, aggressive uh, removal of all the affected tissue, which means their sinus and their eye is sometimes lost, which always bothered me terribly. But um, in the cases I dealt with with this, uh, an ophthalmologist came in and took out the eye. Uh, but uh, 
some of these talks I give like on uh, non-alcoholic steatal hepatitis and uh, the importance of the microbiome and its, a, the, its relationship to type 2 diabetes. Uh, try to keep your blood sugars good and your diet good. Uh, at any rate, uh, 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 Hooke's uh, microscope only got to about 50 power. Hmm. I'm not seeing my, oh, there. I was trying to, there we go. I was trying to advance and I couldn't see anything happening. Um, this is just a drawing of the uh, uh, Hooke's microscope that has an eyepiece, a tube, and the objective is that little point down at the bottom. And he used a um, um, uh, s uh, glass crystal or things containing water to diffuse the light source. Um, and uh, modern microscopes have an aperture that you can adjust so that you can let more or less light in and you sensor for the light source. They often have an electric light, uh, electric light source. I, I used uh, mic uh, microscopes with mirrors a lot when I was young. Uh, when I was in medical school, they gave us a, uh, rented us a uh, microscope with a electric light to use for, uh, a, kept mine about 18 months. I wish I could have bought it. I couldn't afford to, but uh, uh, at any rate, the uh, condenser will diffuse the light so it's not glaring in one spot. And uh, it's really quite a, quite a thing that uh, you have a, a stage and you put a slide on top of that and just having a clear glass slide with a smear on it. And I'll talk more about how to do those later. But uh, there's so much, uh, I think of it as culture. You can say it's technology, but I think there's a culture uh, as part of the culture of science and how people anywhere can look at the microscopic world. And this insert, there's a picture of dead cork. Uh, Hook just took thin slices and it showed these little cells and he was the first to use the term cells. Okay, going further, uh, just to mention John Dalton, Joseph Priestley uh, attributed to um, scientific knowledge that helped a lot in medicine in that uh, uh, it was a transition from alchemy and magical thinking to scientific chemistry and quantitative observations. Um, some of these presaging uh, the uh, atomic theory. Um, I particularly liked uh, uh, Priestley, uh, Joseph Priestley, because he was uh, uh, such an open-minded um, progressive thinker. Uh, he was the one to name um, um, uh, rubber as rubber because he noted uh, a use of it. Uh, it was being uh, imported for, this was going into the age of exploration and um, uh, exploitation of uh, uh, anyone that could be conquered uh, to take their resources and um, often use them for the labor. And uh, so, um, Europe was being flooded with interesting products, and uh, one of those was rubber. Uh, Priestley was the one who noted that rubber would mark away or, or rub away the uh, mark of a pencil on paper. And these, this is just a list of gases uh, that he discovered, and he was clever. He wasn't a chemist originally. He kind of got into it, and... Uh, um, he used uh, a collection uh, over mercury, which was, makes me think of Lavoisier a bit, but uh, who lost his head in the French Revolution. But uh, one of the 
things that Benjamin Franklin encouraged him to write a, a book on his uh, experiments in electricity, and he used it to uh, demonstrate, and I, I, I love this idea that scientific process, uh, scientific progress depends more on the accumulation of new facts that anyone can discover than on the theoretical insights of a few men of genius. And think back, this would have been in um, Great Britain, the time of just uh, worship of uh, just about of Isaac Newton. Newton died, I think, in 1727. So he was legend. And one of the reasons why microscopy didn't advance more, I think, um, is it kind of lay latent for 150 years was because um, uh, mathematical physics was so uh, successful and astronomy and uh, uh, the experimental method in uh, uh, physics uh, was so productive, it drew a lot of talent. Um, I just wanted to show what rubber trees look like. And uh, they d do cuts in them and uh, draw their sap. And the sap was sticky and it would form a, at a right temperature, form kind of a neat substance that bounced and uh, could be shaped. But if it got too hot, it became gooey and sticky, and if it got too cold, it would just crack. And um, so, not to get into this too much, but uh, one thing, I put a lot more information in slides than I can ever cover in talk, but I, my idea is that people can visit my um, slide uh, um, PDF and uh, read through things if they want to pursue it further. But um, Charles Goodyear, uh, in 1847, finally after at least six or seven years of st struggling to figure out how to make rubber uh, usable, he was obsessed with this. He dumped his family on friends who were charitable, and he spent a couple of stints in debtor's prison. And uh, he bought a process where uh, a colleague uh, had discovered that uh, adding sulfur to the rubber, it wasn't sticky. And he found that uh, he, he accidentally dropped some of that on a stove and the heat vulcanized the rubber. And so, sorry, I bumped my microphone. Uh, the uh, uh, vulcanization of rubber was a big step forward. One thing, one little thing aside from making soccer balls and tires is uh, rubber. There's a little rubber seal here. There's uh, modern mason jars uh, actually have a lid that you put over the jar that's separate. And then you have a ring that locks down on it that has uh, a mason invented a tool to uh, cut threads into this zinc lead, uh, this uh, zinc uh, uh, ring uh, cap. and um, the inner lid that lays right in, in contact with your uh, material to be canned is not to be used a second time. Although I guarantee it's people do it. The rubber gets uh, fatigued and has little cracks and you can get bacteria in there and you can get very sick. So um, don't cut corners with that inner lid. Uh, but uh, having a good seal is critical to successful canning. He, this guy also invented the salt shaker. Uh, so I'm up now to where I had uh, gotten before. And amazingly, I did it about 10 minutes faster. Um, so I'm going to stop here, uh, except to add that uh, my, from my mention of chemistry, uh, I'm going to continue this talk uh, at, uh, uh, I guess, uh, in two hours. Um, and uh, the um, uh, in the 1840s, like Helmholtz uh, showed uh, in many writings that physics applied to humans. 
at w human beings were not some uh, 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 magical creation that uh, did not respond to the laws of uh, nature. And uh, uh, Liebig uh, uh, did a similar uh, thing for chemistry. Uh, so I, I mentioned that because I'm, I'm going to tell a story in when I start talking about the seven pandemics of cholera of the first use of IV fluids. And one of the things that was stunning to me was the outrage of the medical community. And it was rejected. And it, it was really not until like 1902, I think, that uh, IV fluids were used again because they didn't understand the physiology and they didn't have precise chemistry. But um, they'd had stunning results. But physicians felt it was outrageous to violate the sanctity of the human body by infusing fluids. And um, it is another thing that reveals the level of magical thinking that humankind has had to overcome to be able to advance. Uh, so I'll stop there. Any questions? Thank you for the applause, Dave. Questions, comments? Thank you, Shanta. Thank you. This will, I, I, I have a lot of neat things uh, uh, to share uh, uh, of things we take for granted and where they came from that uh, happened in the 19th century that uh, I think will be interesting for the next talk. Once I, I'm basically going to walk us up to the uh, beginning of antibiotics and, and then and do a talk after that. It'll probably be January or uh, about uh, uh, focusing on three diseases, mycobacterial diseases, which include tuberculosis and leprosy, uh, syphilis, and uh, malaria. And then uh, we'll have uh, sort of uh, other uh, talks that are, uh, to some degree, disease-oriented uh, uh, that uh, talk about the classes of antibiotics and what we've got and where it's going, what the future of it is. So that's that's my concept. And thank you for letting me indulge in this uh, walk through human history. Uh, as I see everything is connected in a way. Thank you, Jess. Any other questions, comments? When I was in residency, uh, there was one guy who had a real sense of humor, and uh, uh, he was uh, answering questions and uh, there were several medical students with us, and they had a number of questions. And he seemed like he grew weary of the questions. And so he turned and looked at them and says, anyone else want to unload? <laughs> For some reason, that just came to my mind. OK. Well, I thank you for your attention.